I believe God has given you one thing you can do for him. It's unique, it's special, you're perfectly suited to it. In fact, you were made for it. Simply put, God has a plan for your life. He always has, even if it's been hard to see sometimes. Obstacles can kind of get in the way of us understanding that plan. You know, a death in the family, a broken relationship, an unexpected move, a health crisis, a financial setback. But God has already accounted for those detours. He's already working around them. The enemy will tell you that those detours are impassable. You can't get through. You're facing an iron gate. There's no way to get to the other side. You might as well give up. With opposition like that, it's easy to start thinking negatively about yourself and believing that your life is ultimately limited and relatively unimportant. Maybe you even start seeing yourself as just one anonymous face in the whole human race. Seven billion people on the planet. What impact could you really make? How could your life possibly matter? But last week I told you that's not how God sees you. In God's eyes, you matter. To him, your gifts are essential to his plan. You are one of a kind. You stand out from the crowd. To God, every life is special. Every person is a work in progress waiting to be revealed as one of God's masterpieces. Now, you may have struggled with understanding God's plan for your life, or maybe you still struggle with it, but that doesn't mean that there isn't one. So today, I want to talk with you about how to understand God's master plan for your existence. And the big idea is really simple. To know God's plan for your life, you have to know God. Getting to know God better will make his plan clearer to you. But getting to know God is a lifelong endeavor. It can be difficult, there are twists and turns, and it can be confusing. And so today, I would also like to offer just four ideas, four thoughts, four points for reflection about how maybe you and I can get to know God even more fully so that we can understand his plan even more completely. Here's the first point. To know God, to know God, you have to know his voice. To know God, you have to be able to recognize his voice amid all the other voices out there. Samuel was a young man in the Bible who did not know God. For years, his mother Hannah had prayed for a child. She had promised God that if he gave her a son, she would give him right back to serve God all the days of his life. When Samuel was born, she made good on that promise. She brought Samuel to the temple, and from an early age, Samuel grew up there under the guidance of an old priest named Eli. Late one night, as we heard in the reading, Samuel was sleeping in the temple. He heard a voice calling his name. He thought it was Eli, but it was actually God's voice. He gets up and he runs to Eli. Eli says, go back to bed. It wasn't me. Over and over, Samuel kept mistaking God's voice for that of Eli, his mentor. It took God four times <laughs> to get his attention. The reason for that is that Samuel, as the first reading says, was not familiar with the Lord. Until Eli taught him the ways of God and how to speak to him, it didn't make sense. He couldn't recognize his voice. But when Eli taught him that, how to speak to God, how to know his ways, everything fell into place. Samuel began to understand his, God's plan and purpose for his life. And the Bible goes on to say that Samuel grew up and the Lord was with him, not permitting any word of his to be without effect. To know God, you have to be able to recognize his voice amid all the other voices out there in the world and including your own voice in your head. I do that all the time when I'm praying. I'm like, okay, is this my voice or is this God's voice or is this some, 
other thing I heard somewhere that's, that I'm just dredging up in my mind. We have to be able to distinguish it. And the thing about that is it takes practice. It takes practice. So maybe one of your New Year's resolutions might be to practice a little more hearing God's voice, spending a little more time in silence. At Christmas time, I talked with you about creating a beautiful prayer space in your home. I hope you did that. If you haven't, you can still do it. It's easy. It's the perfect place and time to just spend a few moments trying to listen to God's voice. It takes practice. To know God, you have to know his voice. Here's the second point. To know God, you have to actually look for him. Long ago, in the time of Jesus, there were two disciples who wanted to know God. They were trying to learn about God, and they were learning about him from John the Baptist. They were his followers and were his disciples. We often think of John the Baptist as this kind of figure who's a solitary figure, you know, alone in the desert, but he actually had a circle of followers and disciples who learned from him and learned from his teachings about God. Well, one day he's teaching his disciples and Jesus walks by and all of a sudden it's like, you know, the record player, rip, John the Baptist stops everything. He points to Jesus and he says, he says something strange. We heard it in the gospel reading. He says, behold, the Lamb of God. Really strange, unless you know the context. John was referring to an ancient text in the Old Testament of the Bible written hundreds of years earlier by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah had predicted that one day there would be a suffering servant who would come to save the people by dying for their sins. Isaiah said this suffering servant would be like a lamb led to slaughter. In other words, the Lamb of God. Well, when these two disciples heard this, they started following Jesus. Literally, they were tailing him. And after a while, Jesus turns around and he asks them, what are you looking for? Most important question, isn't it? It's like the basic question of our human existence. What are you really looking for in life? My friend Robert was a successful businessman. He started in the early days uh, of Microsoft as a coder, made a lot of money when the stock sold. He took that money, invested it in another business, made it, grew it into a successful enterprise and then sold it for even more money. From humble beginnings in a small little town in the Midwest, Robert had achieved the American dream and more. But eventually Robert came to a crossroads he knew he needed to start looking for something more than money and success. A lot of people don't know what they're looking for, and so they start chasing after the wrong things, many of the wrong things. But Robert had figured out that wealth, power, possessions, prestige, number of followers, whatever it is on your social media, ultimately these are not the right things to look for. So now Robert, is pursuing God. Like the two men in the gospel, he's looking for God. To know God, to know your plan, the plan God has for you in your life, you have to, you have to know God, and to know God, you have to look for him. Above and beyond all the other wonderful things out there in this world. Third, to know God, you have to decide where your heart really is, where it really wants to belong. The two men who are following Jesus, they ask him, where are you staying? You know, it sounds like a strange question, right? When you first meet somebody, you, go, you don't say, where are you staying? You say, where'd you go to school? Uh, where'd you grow up? You know, you don't say where you're staying, but that's what they asked. Disciples often traveled with their rabbis. So it was a reasonable question. They, on one level, wanted to know where Jesus was staying for the night if they were going to have to travel with him. Jesus responds with an invitation. He says, come and see. And that invitation was much deeper than just overnight accommodations. That invitation was to remain with him. The Greek word in, in the gospel passage there for stay has a much deeper meaning. It means more like remain, like you would remain 
with someone in their, in their heart, right? It's a matter of the heart. Jesus spoke a lot to his disciples about remaining with him always. It is a matter of the heart. Jesus wants our hearts to choose to remain with him always. And that means wherever your heart is, that's where your priorities are. So he wants us to make him our first priority. A friend's college-age daughter over the Christmas break told her that she is sick and tired of watching her mom stressed out all the time. She does too much, her calendar is too full, she works full time, she's working out and trying to get in shape, she has an active social life, and lately she took up knitting. And now she stresses out over not meeting her self-imposed quota of how many articles she needs to knit in a certain period of time. Well, enough was enough, and her daughter sat her down over the Christmas break and said, Mom, you've got to focus on the most important things. Knitting, for example, she said, can wait till retirement. Focus on what's important. Stay with the most important priorities. Out of the mouths of babes, right? Really good advice. Because our hearts determine our priorities. And to know God, you have to make him your first priority and where your heart really chooses to remain. It's a matter of making Jesus matter to you, to your life. That's our mission statement, by the way, at this church. We say our mission, the reason we exist, is to make Jesus matter to everyone. But it is a matter of the heart. So to know God, you have to, you have to look for him. You have to be able to identify his voice and recognize his voice. But you also need to make a commitment to remain with him, stay with him in a heart-to-heart -heart relationship forever. Last point, to know God, you need a guide. You need a guide. You can't do it alone. Faith is a team sport. You cannot succeed on your own. You need people to help you along the way. After Andrew one of the two men in the gospel reading, after he followed Jesus, he went immediately and got his brother Simon. He said, we have found the Messiah. Andrew was completely convinced of it. He had recognized Jesus' voice. He was looking for, for Jesus. He was looking for God. And he had decided he was going to remain with Jesus. But that wasn't enough. He needed to go get his brother Simon and bring him to Jesus. And when he did, Jesus renamed Simon Peter. And that's when Peter understood God's plan and purpose for his life. Because Peter, as Jesus said, means kephas, which means rock. Peter would be the rock upon which Jesus would build his church. Had Andrew never gone and brought his brother to Jesus, Peter would never have known the Lord. He would never have been the first pope. He would never have written the letters in the New Testament. He would never have been the leaders of the other disciples. For that matter, had John the Baptist not pointed Jesus out as the one that his disciples should ultimately follow, none of this would have happened. Everyone needs a guide. Everyone needs someone to bring them more closely to Jesus, more, more closely to Jesus. Everyone needs that. To be a guide, to bring someone to Jesus, you don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be an expert in the Bible. You don't have to be a priest and a nun or a nun. <laughs> Andrew hardly knew Jesus. He had just known him for an afternoon, a couple of hours when he went and got his brother Simon and, and the rest became history. John the Baptist, this might surprise you, he didn't know Jesus either. He was his cousin. Jesus and John were cousins, but John was raised apart from his family. A lot of credible scholars believe today that John the Baptist actually was raised in the desert by a community of ascetics who lived there, and he didn't know Jesus. He didn't know Jesus by sight. This community was called the Essenes, by the way. You may have heard of them, um, but he didn't know Jesus. He just knew him by faith. 
He knew him when he saw him by faith. Being a guide for someone else and bringing them to Christ, it's a privilege. And the only requirement is a little bit of faith. Last week, I shared with you our hope for Lent. We're launching a spiritual campaign to help everyone in our church learn more about God, learn about what God's plan and purpose is for their lives, and just grow deeper in their faith. We're going to be using a book called Rebuilt Faith, written by Father Michael White and his associate Tom Corcoran. The homilies during Lent will be supplemented by the book and by small group discussions. And when you join one of our small groups, we'll give you the book for free. Small groups are the way to make a big church small. They're the way for you to meet other people and to grow in your faith at the same time. We say it's like doing life together. And this Lenten campaign would be a golden opportunity for you to sample a small group for a short and definite period of time, just seven weekly sessions beginning February 11th. And you know, God often speaks to us about his plan and purpose for our lives through other people. Small groups are the perfect place to learn more about that, to grow in your faith, to connect with other people, to feel like you belong. It's so important. And so I encourage everyone to please consider this. It's a limited period of time, a short period of time, and it's so important. It is a game changer for your faith life, I promise you. Two Sundays from now will be Sign Up Sunday, January 28th. We'll have opportunities for you to sign up before then. Make sure you look at Flock Note and our website beginning a little later this week. But in two weeks on January 28th, we'll tell you all about the groups that are available, who's leading them, what times they're meeting, what days of the week they're meeting, and where they're meeting. We'll have groups on Zoom for those of you who would like to join online. And we'll have groups in person as well. They'll meet in homes and cafes and parks, and some of them will meet here on our campus. This will be a game changer not only for you, but for our parish as well. We'll become a parish not just with small groups, but we'll become a parish of small groups. And if we do this together, everything will change. Everything will grow. Everything will be better, even better than it is now. So stay tuned for that on Sign Up Sunday. We'll have an easy way for you to sign up, and, um, and we'll give you more details as we go along. So how does God really see you? What is his plan and purpose for your life? These are questions we all want to know the answers to or should want to know the answers to. The answer is right in the gospel today. Jesus says it straight out to those two disciples. Come and you will see. 